correct? Yeah. I mean, people do lie to your face, but it's easier not to. <laughs> right, right. And then maybe um, because there's some private remarks that you can add in, maybe in the private remarks, you can put um, whether or not they're working with another agent. Right. Or like, you know, big backyard, very important to them, whatever. Yes. Yes. And that's what I like about writing notes on a sign in sheet, because after right. I talk to somebody, I usually flip it over and then I write my own notes on the back. Yeah. Um, you know, must have open concept kitchen, doesn't like stairs, big backyard, you know, anything like that. Right. Make notes on. We're just going to Clorox wipe the um, sign in clipboard and have a big thing of Clorox wipes there and wipe the do the pens so that Perfect. people see us doing that. Because I agree, once they hand it back to me, I want to write everything down because then yep. I, you know, I keep all of my open house. Yes. Sheets, and that way I, and I refer to them, you know, by open house by month, when I need to follow up with people, I go back to my original notes just in case I miss something. That's a great idea. That's a great idea. And I think that the hardest or most important, hardest slash most important thing about real estate is keeping things organized because it's really easy when you're done with an open house to throw those papers on the desk in a folder in you know, so to try and keep things all straightened out um, and organized, Annie, I love your your filing system with everything because it, it does come back and I'll sort of make a list, maybe put it on a spreadsheet on um, Delafield Open House. We had so many people through and they were looking for X. Um, Milwaukee Open House and things, I was talking to Janine yesterday on this whole COVID thing, Milwaukee County and Waukesha County are totally different. We are, we are back to normal out here in Waukesha County. When you go to the bars and the restaurants, you can't even move. Everything is, nobody's doing social distancing out here. We have a couple of restaurants who are wearing masks, but it's interesting. What are you guys all figuring, finding with all of this? Are things well, loosening up? It's not open yet. <laughs> it's annoying. <laughs> what is it? Milwaukee is not open normal. Yeah. Yeah, Waukesha County, everything's open here. Actually, I'm this afternoon. I'm at Fox Point, and there, nothing is like, real, you're wearing masks, no one's really out. And I'm actually in Oshkosh right now visiting my dad. And we went out last night, and it's like, it's like, it's, it's completely over here. It's, it's mm -hmm. yeah. so weird. It's yeah. like a different world here. Yeah, that's how it is out here. Fooleries on the lake here down the street. By 1130, that deck is so packed, you can't even yeah. get in. We, we drove by with our boat yesterday, and we couldn't even stop because there's no place. There's no mm -hmm. parking places. And the hideaway, another bar, we were going to stop for a bite to eat, get a drink. You can't even park. You, they're all double parked out there. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm here boating, too, and so it's very weird. Like, it's, it's like it's last summer. Like, nothing happened. Yep, and everybody's and front and back on the deck. You, there, there isn't even elbow room, much less six feet of distance. Yeah. <laughs> I wonder why, I mean, is it because we're so more densely populated in Milwaukee County? That's well, the mayor has not allowed the businesses to open yet. They're still under very large restrictions. Crazy. Well, yeah, yeah the poor business owners, they're like doing anything and everything. There's a a bar right here in the third ward we know the owners and they have a parking lot that's like their parking lot for the restaurant they're actually repaving it and they're going to extend it so there's more outdoor seating okay so that they can try to have business <laughs> yeah um i was talking to one of the restaurant owners down here and um, when they opened they took out every other bar stool you know for social distancing they removed seven tables and he said that his bar till rang so high um, because everybody was standing at the bar and yeah. they served even more than they ever have versus somebody just sitting at that bar stool. He said, we had so much walk up service to that bar. He says, my numbers were so high. He says, I kind of like it. He says, I followed the rules, but you yeah. can't make people, you yeah. know, stay far from each other. And so it's, it's very interesting city by city or even county by county. So. Sorry, that was my dog. I wonder how Madison is doing. Anybody here? 
I don't know. I, I think don't know. Madison might be similar to us, uh, Milwaukee. The Milwaukee, okay. I feel like they are, yeah. Okay, I would um, think so. Madison College Bars are open. Oh, I'm there you sure go. the college bars are open. W's open. Yeah, well, I know it's like it's really made businesses and become very creative. So, and some of it's not a bad thing. Well, creative, and you know, maybe we could have used a little cleanup. <laughs> yeah, it's not, a, right. it's not a bad thing. I and there are some places that I went to that. Okay, I like corner bars, but some of them were pretty bad. And hopefully, they'll they'll clean up a little bit. So maybe it's a good thing in that aspect. Yeah, for sure. So, Janine, did you have anybody at your open houses last weekend that were kind of freaked out? Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Um, mo mainly our sellers, very okay. concerned about safety. I think that's the number one thing I've heard. Um, okay. And very cautious buyers. But they were very compliant. They... Mm -hmm. I think they like that we are erring on the side of caution versus come on in. Yeah. Um, and I just think that says a lot about you as an agent that you're cognizant. And honestly, if they don't want to come in with a mask, then um, when they make their private showing, they're going to have to wear a mask anyway. So mm -hmm. um, I didn't get any kind of, weird feedback and I gotta be honest I was a little nervous okay I had Jordan my assistant man the door and no one had any eye rolling or are you kidding it was okay appreciative um Good. Sunday I had an open house and I think Saturday or Sunday I can't remember and they were coming up a, a family on bikes and we have masks to provide, but we don't really want to advertise that because they're expensive. Anyway, mm -hmm. I heard them say, oh, we have to wear masks. Let's keep going. We were just, we were just killing time. And I thought, perfect. Ah, good. You know, we, you know, it's not that we don't want those people killing time because you can develop a relationship. You don't know where it's going to go. But I felt it was more... Um, I felt like the serious buyers were out there. The looky loos are not <laughs> sticking around going to open houses if they have to mask up and you know all of that. So yep. I felt like I said I picked up three buyers on one open house wow. that were just so eager That's to amazing. have an agent like face to face or mask to mask and. Mm -hmm. Well, one of them, they were both radiologists, and they said, you know, Hi. we really appreciate the fact that you guys are being really safe, because we're going we're gonna to be safe, because we work in a hospital, and we appreciate that you're, you know, taking this serious, so. Yeah. I'm sure awesome. it will wean out and, you know, all of that, but for right now, you know, I just I set up a showing and I just got a text from the agent saying, make sure you and your buyer are masked. Um, interestingly enough, a uh, home inspection yesterday on one of my listings and it, it's, in our, it's in our MLS, in our remarks, must be masked, um, take off your shoes. Well, the seller called me and said, I happen to have my nanny cam on. And they're not wearing masks. No one took their shoes off. The inspector, the agent, and the buyers. And I went, okay. So I texted the agent and I said, friendly reminder, please. Everyone must have their shoes off and masks on. Yes. Yeah. And? People are, he goes, I don't know. He said some remark, like, of course. And yeah. I felt like, saying, of course you're not. It was an old guy who was supposed to retire. <laughs> you know how I feel about old guy realtors who should really be retired. Mm. I know. No, and he was a young guy. Oh, okay. Yeah. So today we thought we would talk about objections, right, Connie? Yep. And yep. boy, they start right away. Just, you know, right away. Let's start at the open house when 
you're trying to get information from them. I used to have my people sign in. I no longer do that. I use our open house script. So I'm getting their information because then I can write it down in my own handwriting. Um, and then it just starts a dialogue. So I was getting objections um, of, oh, I, I don't feel comfortable signing in. So I kind of just eliminated that. I'll ask them, um, you know, I'll just start doing a friendly conversation and then basically say, um, are you interested in knowing about properties weeks, if not months before they go on the market? And who's not going to say yes to that? And if they say, or I'll, I'll start off first is how did you hear about this open house? And they'll say Trulia or Zillow. Great. Who is your agent? And most of them are going to say, I don't have one. If they have one, then I always compliment that agent. Oh, that's a great agent and leave it at that. Um, but if they say, I don't have an agent, great. Would you like to know about properties weeks, if not months before they go on the market? Yes. Great. I need your name and phone number and your email address. So I try to eliminate objections right away so they can't say no. And so you're eliminating that. Let's say then you meet with them, that you they give you your information and you're going to start showing a house. Now that open house wasn't for them, you've contacted each other and they found a house they wanted to look at and you want to talk about buyer agency. Um, you know what, Connie? I've just met you and I think you're great, but I really don't know enough about you. And what I do is right now, I'm just calling the listing agents and looking at the homes we're interested in. I'm not really ready at all to sign a buyer's agency agreement and be committed to somebody. Okay, I, I fully understand that. What we like to do in the um, real estate world is uh, we have this um, state form. It's called the buyer agency. And with the buyer agency, I can give you the insight on properties um, that, you know, I really couldn't tell you about unless if we have a signed buyer agency, because in the state of Wisconsin, we really do work for the listing or for the sellers and not for the buyers unless if we have this. So I can give you all of the inside scoop on this house if we do have a, a signed buyer agency. Okay, well, I'm not really comfortable signing anything right now, but we do want to look at some houses with you. Okay, um, if I'm going to put the time and the effort into showing you houses, um, I can you know, meet you at the first house. And this is something that if this doesn't work out, we can definitely cancel the buyer agency, but to um, give you all of the information and do the best job that I can do, I do really need to have a buyer agency and I can bring that along to your first, to our first showing. Okay. Is there like a fee or anything for that? I do not charge a, a fee for a buyer agency. So everything is paid for by the seller. So you do not lose out on any monies by having a buyer agent. Okay. Wait, you don't charge a buyer agency fee? I do not. Nobody out here does. Dang it. Here's that Milwaukee and Waukesha County thing again. <laughs> it's so glad. It's so good to have us together. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Janine. <laughs> no, it's good. <laughs> so, so Janine, I knew you were going to hit me with that one. <laughs> Janine, this is Laura. Can I ask? So what is yeah. your response to that? Because yours is obviously different. Yeah. I mean, so. Do I have an answer for you, Janine? <laughs> <laughs> so... My response is this, um, I have a $295 fee in which you do not pay until you close. So you're not paying me anything up front. I honestly don't work with anyone without a buyer agency agreement and I'll tell you why. I have a really big mouth and I can't walk into a property and not share my opinion. So I'll be happy to meet with you at the first house. Um, and we'll go from there. And that's when I bring that buyer agency agreement. And if they say, if they ask me any questions regarding the house, well, what do you think about the price? You know what, here's the agreement. I really need for you to sign that you guys, I do not 
I, I, I don't want to get in any kind of trouble. And I do want to represent you. And this is the only way I can do it legally. That's it. And if they're not willing to sign a buyer agency agreement, I'm really not willing to work with somebody because you guys, it's a time waster. They're looking, I think for not everyone, but people are looking for those who are not as experienced and will just show them properties. They're door openers. Don't become a door opener at all. You're I have a question off. Janine, so when going off just a bit, when you do have, you're with your buyer and they do ask that, you know, what are you thinking about? What is your response to them? How much help are you giving them in gauging them in price? Yeah, with or without buyer agency? With buyer agency. Oh. With them, they're like, what do you think this house is? What do you think we ought to offer? How much do you go there? I go there 100% in. 100% in. So I'm going to make sure that I have researched my properties, mm -hmm. you know, looking at the current solds in the neighborhood and what's on the market now and how long I've been on the market, price yeah. per square foot. If I don't know right then and there, because if you're showing them like five or six houses and you, you don't know, then you say, you know what? Let me go back and research the price of this home because we were looking at so many and I can really give you a great figure, a ballpark range of where I think this house should sit. Mm -hmm. So don't shoot off the hip if you don't know, because if you don't know, you don't know. They don't care. Just you have the tools to find out. So I was always thinking, oh my God, I have to know this like right now. I should have a general idea when I'm pulling up MLS and I'm scheduling the showings. I'm going to look at this and go, huh, I think this is a little overpriced. You know, uh, I try to be as prepared as I can. But if they have buyer agency, I'm going to let them know what I think. When I go to show properties, I print off, and actually I get this one from, I've always printed off two sheets, one for me and one for the buyer. Yeah. Um, and Mary Beth actually said, I do mine in black and white because I'm not going to waste my color, which totally mm. makes sense. And I'm not flipping through. Is this mine or is this theirs? Yes. Um, I go through and I write down any past sales on that info sheet. I write down the assessed value. Um, and a lot of times if we're looking in the same area. I will write the assessed to sale value down also on what has sold in the neighborhood. And that will help you, um, you know, get a little bit better grip on properties. Yeah, I, I go through MLS days on market. Um, if it's been listed before, when did it sell the last? I pull up the condition report and things to know because nine times out of 10, they're going to say, how old's the roof? Yep. So hopefully that that information is online. Yep. But um, it's so helpful. It is really look in the remarks to see if there's anything that they've added. But be prepared to answer all of those questions. Yes. And if you're showing four or five properties, I mean, I'm not that good. I get them all confused. So right. I have to look at my notes and I'll put on the bottom clean wrecker, um, yep. wrecker dash, um, new drain tile in the basement, wrecker dash, Flooding on rainy days, record dash, new roof. Yep. So I put that in the little notes in the bottom also. Yeah. I, I have a question. Um, back to the buyer agency thing just a little bit. I do um, a lot of showings for other agents. And the first time ever yesterday when I was showing this guy property, obviously not my client, super nice, whatever. Um, he asked me a ton of very detailed things that I didn't have all the answers to what I actually had to say. Like, you need to ask her. She can investigate these things. It was a four, yep. family, you know. And he was like, well, what's your cut of this? What Do you get, like, a piece of her commission? And I said, no. Typically, agents, if we're doing a favor, they offer to pay us maybe 20 bucks for an hour. And he's like, oh, that's it? And I was like, yeah. And then he tried to get me to go back and give him more details on things. And I said, look. You can schedule a second showing, talk to your agent. I mean, do you have any advice on how much information we should be giving them? Yeah, I probably wouldn't be giving them any. Um, I would just 
whoever that agent is that you're showing, because I'm sure it varies, is to make it really clear that you are the showing agent and you are opening the door. Mm. And to really, they have to educate their clients to say, you know, um, Mary Sue is meeting you at the property and she's gonna open the door for you. But if you have any questions regarding the property, which I'm sure you will, that will come back to me as the agent because you don't wanna put yourself in that position of giving incorrect information or, you know, how do you know they have buyer agency? You know, it could be someone that's actually testing to see how, how you are communicating with a non-client. So be careful with that. Okay, thank you. Yeah, good question. So, good all right. As well. Yeah. Um, kind of going back to what you said earlier, why do you um, put the assessed value and you're comparing the excess, assessed value um, since assessments in each community are so different in how they come up with the assessments and some places just have jacked up their assessments? Yes. Um, so here's, here's another thing, Milwaukee County versus Waukesha County, which I just love that we have a touch of both things here. In Milwaukee County, um, you guys really figure out your price per square foot. And I know Jimmy does it all the time. Out here, um, you can have a 1960s ranch across the street. So a 1960s ranch that's valued at $250,000 across the street from a million dollar house. So if we take that square footage, that million dollar house is going to be priced so much higher, obviously, than this 1960s ranch that the square foot isn't gonna mean jack. So what I like to do a lot of times is I take their assessed to sale value. So you're taking your um, assessment of your tax taxes of your property and comparing that to the sale price and you'll get a percentage on the comparable houses in the neighborhood. Because our, like um, we have, I'm just gonna grab Bristlecone Pines is a golf course community right across the street is a subdivision that has a bunch of 1950s, 60s, and 70s ranches and kind of funky houses that were built in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. So even though they're within one mile or within a half a mile versus you guys in Bayview, one developer came in and they built the exact same house in the whole entire neighborhood. I mean, you do have some bigger houses on Lake Drive, you know, so there is a little bit of a comparable, but I do like to look at the assessment and the assessed to sale value. Does and you know sense? what I do it for, for me is because everyone's going to ask what the assessed value is. Yep. <laughs> they always do. Yep. So I might as well know, you know, they're going to ask. And then I have to explain to them here that that doesn't, that does not determine value. And it's going to vary from house to house, but nine out of 10 people are going to say, what is it assessed at? So huh. I need to have that info. Yeah. Um, the info you okay. have, the better you look. You got it. Um, so let's go back to, um, they've signed by your agency now because now they're shamed. They want to know the inside <laughs> scoop. And if they're going to get it, they're going to get it by having a buyer agency agreement. So then let's talk about um, looking at houses. They find the perfect house. You know, it's everything that they've talked about. And um, give me an objection of why they wouldn't write an offer, Connie. It is the perfect house. Well, Janine, you know, it's really priced high. And you told me the assessed value is only $300,000. And they're asking four and a quarter. I just think that's, that's outrageous. Well, again, so the assessed value doesn't determine the market value. So let's go back and look at those comparable properties that have sold in the last six months. So actually, Connie, price per square foot, they might be a little aggressive. However, it's within shooting range. So, okay, so if we pay asking price of 425, won't my taxes just go through the roof? Your taxes will be adjusted on your sales price but looking at our, our mill rate, it, you know, it may go up a little bit. I can't really determine that. Okay. But they will, they will go up and it may not go up immediately. Okay. Sometimes it takes a little while for them to, to, you know, to catch on, but yeah, they will go up. So Absolutely. you have comparables that 
you know, this just seems, this seems expensive to me because we do have to put work into the house. Yeah. But if you're looking at the comparables of what's sold, you know, I'm thinking that if you, if you're, if the price of, let's say it's 400,000 and you guys want to go in at 380, that $20,000 difference is going to be minimal on your monthly payment, Connie. And honestly, do you want to start all over again and go through this process and we're back to where we were today? So there's not that big of a difference between 400 and 380,000? No, and I actually will show you the difference because I love the focus title calculator, you guys. It can basically show you what that difference is going to be like that. Mm -hmm. So I kind of explain over 30 years, that $20,000 or whatever is minimal on your monthly payment. So again, we're not looking at the assessed value, we're looking at the market value. And honestly, Connie, there might be some properties that we may have to write an offer over asking price. So I want you to keep that in mind too. It's going to be determined by the competitiveness. So I just pulled up the calculator quick because I do the same thing. The $20,000 difference, and this is at, oh, let me put, we can get a 30 year at uh, probably, hmm. anybody know what a 30 year is at today-ish? Three five or are we at three seven now? Three point oh, I, I got no, no. three point three seven five I yesterday. Just, my buyers just locked in at two point eight seven five yesterday. Whoa. Nikes. Wozy Waka. I love it. Damn yeah. it. It just refinanced for three. Are you kidding me? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so um a twenty thousand dollar difference on a thirty year fixed at three point two five is guess what? Anybody? How much a month? Come on, play my game. Come on. $3. $20,000 over a 30 year fixed is $87 a month. So at $87 a month, and then I always bring up my, my calculator. So at $87 a month divided by four weeks, that's $20 a week. That's four cups of Starbucks a week. Right. And, and I totally throw in the Starbucks thing, especially if they walk up Saturday morning with a Starbucks in their hand. And I mean, usually it's the difference of $10,000. So we're at one, we're at two cups of coffee a week to have the exact house that you want that has your kitchen. Yeah. And then they usually, then they usually say, okay, let's write. Yeah. And how would you feel if you didn't, if you didn't get this home because of a an $80 a month difference. Now, mind you, there are some that they've reached their limit and that is over. Yes. So, you know, we have to be aware of that. All right. So now they've written the offer and um, they, they, got, they have an accepted offer. Now we're going through home inspection. And you know what? This is what I hear all the time. Um, on the, on the list side, but uh, home inspection, we're gonna ask for everything, Connie, everything. Um, okay. There's a lot of things that showed up on this report and I would just rather go through the report and ask for everything and see what sticks with the seller. Okay, uh, you know, Janine, I totally understand your concerns. And yeah. when the inspector goes in, it is his job because you've paid him to find out everything that's wrong with that house. He has checked every window He's checked every outlet, but in our offer to purchase, what we have to stick by, as we had discussed in our buyer agency, we are looking for defects and safety issues. So defects are something that will cause injury or devalue that house. Um, and you know, if, if everything is fine today when you're purchasing the house, we can't guarantee the future. So all of your appliances are in great working order you know, we never know how long a refrigerator is going to last. There is 20 years on that roof, but it is rated as a 30 year roof. You've got 10 years left on that. You are just fine. And it's the cost of maintenance on a house. So what we're going to do is go through that inspection report and we're going to pull out the defects and safety issues. Does that well, help you out? I feel like we, you know, we paid 15,000 over and you know, they got a great price. So even if it may not be a defect or a safety issue, they should have this house up to par. So 
I, again, I want to add some things on because if they, they can come back and say they don't want to do it. Um, but that's kind of where we're at. We're going to just be prepared, Connie. Okay. I, you know, I totally understand that, but we have to stick with the contract. And like I said, when we're in negotiations for a house, we're purchasing the house today as is not what's going to happen in the future. And we have to stick with safety items and defects. And that's exactly what is stated on the contract on line 216, whatever it is. Um, and we were in competition. And this is, this is the way our market is at this point in time. Yeah. Yeah. And, and what I say too is if we put in a bunch of honeydew lists and, and you're really good about explaining how a home inspection amendment works prior to, um, but I'll always say, this is a honeydew list. These are things that are exactly what Connie said, defects or safety issues. Mm -hmm. And if we start throwing in honeydew lists with the two top most important items, then those items are going to be lost as far as their, their ranking. Mm -hmm. So when I give out a send out the home inspection when they get the report i will always say let's t discuss the report in 24 hours and i want you to come up with your top five things that you would like to be addressed in a home inspection amendment and that kind of for me it eliminates all the willy-nilly piddly stuff on an, an amendment they kind of already know stay in your lane and let's stay focused on this amendment when I then have a discussion with them over the phone, I never give my opinion first. I'll say, so what do you guys think? And I always look at the inspection report before I give it to them. Yes. Look it over. And most inspectors, at least the ones that I use, are really good at summarizing everything in the first couple of pages. I skim through the rest, but I really read through the key items um, on the first two pages of the report. Because those are usually always your safety items and your defects. So Connie, it said that the um, air conditioner was working, but it's at the end of its, it's, you know, it's at the end of its life, you know? So it sounds like this thing is gonna go any soon. Um, so we wanna ask for a new air conditioning unit. Well, unfortunately, the air conditioning unit is working right now. What I would suggest is a home warranty. We can add on a home warranty and um, your appliances and your mechanics are covered for a year after your purchase. That would probably help you out just in case if it should go down. Hmm, okay. I wanna say that's not true necessarily. I just went through an issue with um, the furnace and that's what I had told my folks because mm -hmm. they were getting a home warranty and I called residential home warranty and they will not replace the furnace. They will, um, they will come out, they will try to fix it, um, but they will not replace the entire furnace. So I just, we have to be careful about what we're saying to them. Yeah, you're right. Um, I always say, because they're going to try to repair that in any way possible before they replace it. They told me they wouldn't replace it. When mm. I called over the phone to home warranty, they said that they would not replace the entire furnace, even if it went down. Mm -hmm. And I guess it, it might depend on what they found during the initial home inspection. So, you know, this is what I always say too. I had a, a home out in... I don't know, Glendale, and the air conditioner was at the end of its life. Um, basically, we had a year warranty with the offer. They wanted a new unit, and I said, they're not going to do it. It's, it's at the end of its life, but it's working now. Um, so what we're going to do instead is we're going to offer you another year home warranty. So they are obligated to repair that air conditioner if it is not working. Period, the end. And that's all I say. <laughs> I am not in the home warranty business. Well, and it's listed as covered in the yeah. application. Right. And 
you today it's working tomorrow it may not be and i've heard both sides of that home warranty that's why i kind of i don't get into it because i have heard that and then i've heard that they've gotten a brand new i had a listing right over here a brand new air conditioner from the home warranty company yeah so janine you have a certain company that you know is going to be easier to work with than others because there's so many different ones and every agent uses somebody different it's nice to hear what like well we just switched keller williams the home warranty company so before i think we were using hsa Correct. Um, and there was some bad and good with that one too i had an incident where it was inspected it was a furnace um they closed and about a year later they couldn't it was it was not going to be fixed any longer and they went back to our home warranty company it was still under warranty and there was some pushback from it but it did get resolved mm -hmm. they did replace that furnace i've always had good luck with hms hms yeah okay which is now what is it quest or I don't, know, no, I don't know i think it's cinch maybe cinch that's what it is uh, same number. I never like to rely on home warranties to fix or or I'm not going to promise that they're going to do much of anything. Yeah. I, I, I hand them the brochure and yeah. Yep. So Janine and Connie, can I ask you, um, you said you don't, you like to say, so what do you guys think? Because you don't want to give information either way based on the home inspection. But what if you have somebody who says, hey, look, I, I signed a buyer agency agreement with you. You're supposed to give me your perspective or insider information what do you think from what came back what are the are there any like automatic red flags where you go yep. yes i so take i'm gonna say uh, you know what i want to hear from you first you know mr and mrs buyer what your main concerns are with this home inspection report and then let's work from that list and then i'll have my input as well okay. but i am not a home inspector I, you know i am not a mechanic but I want to know what's most important to you because what's most important to them may not be what's most important to you. What's most important to me. However, if I see a defect that they are not concerned about, I am definitely going to be having that conversation, especially yeah. if it's, you know, a foundation issue and, you know, a wall was out of plumb. I'm going to say, you guys, we need to get someone out here and take a look at that basement wall. You know, you do have that obligation to protect. But what I did find is when I first started and I get that home inspection report, I'm like, okay, well, we got to do this. We got to do that. We got to do that. And some of those things they really weren't concerned about. Mm -hmm. They want that house and they don't want to blow it up and they're looking for your expertise, but let them speak first. Okay. Well, and yeah. keep in mind, you don't know the, um, abilities of the buyer, right? Sample numbers. So I had a deal that um, the outlets didn't work in the kitchen, and you know, I we went through a couple little things that this young gentleman wanted fixed, and I said, well, what about those outlets in the kitchen? He says, oh, I'm not worried about anything electrical, because my uncle is coming in next week. He's going to replace all the outlets, and we're going to put can lights throughout the whole thing. Okay. <laughs> and I would have highly suggested bringing in a licensed electrician to um, replace all the GFCI outlets in the kitchen because they weren't working, you know. And he said, oh no, my uncle's coming in. And you know, some people are really, really handy and they would rather, you know, take a little monies off, excuse me, of the deal or just not have it fixed in order to make um, the deal run more smooth. And like Janine said, not blow up. So really, really take into consideration that this is their house, it's not yours. And I've had, especially newer agents, they'll send me the inspection report and say, oh my gosh, I'm gonna tell them to do A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H. I said, first of all, there's not that many lines on the amendment. <laughs> but it's, it's definitely up to the buyer, not the agent on what needs to be fixed on that house. Yeah, that was really a hard, lesson for me because i i remember i was dealing with a very savvy on the listing side um seller and we got this home inspection amendment and 
I started to give him my opinion of it and I should have waited for his opinion because he's like, yep, that will do, that will do. Actually, he was doing more than I thought. I, I needed to get out of my own way. I always say one of these and two of those for a reason. So I listen more and talk less. Okay. Yep. Okay, so we've negotiated the home inspection. Um, and let's say we close that out. Now let's go to the listing appointment, which is where you're going to hear a lot of objections right away. They, they are ready for you to throw out those objections. And the first thing it's going to be is, um, well, most likely price, not all the time, but you've come up with the price and they're saying, um, you're $50,000 under what we need to get from our home. So let's talk about that. Um, one of the questions I like to ask in the beginning is, you know, is there a certain net price that you need to have to sell this property? Especially if you feel like it might be a distressed situation. I wanna know where they're at right away. Um, second of all, when they say that I need to get $50,000 more, then I turn it back to say, it's un I understand where you're coming from, but the market doesn't know what your needs are and the, the the list price isn't going to be adjusted to, unfortunately, what our needs are. So I'm going to show you what the market's doing right now. And in order to sell your house at the highest amount possible in, a, in the fastest amount of time, here is the price that I recommend. And I know that that's important to you, right? And you just try to get them to agree. So let's say they don't really have to get a certain amount, but they want a certain amount in their mind. So again, it's going back to the market and looking at the comparables. And I always say, you know what, if we start out high and we have to do a price reduction, average statistics show that when you do one price reduction on your house, there's two more behind it. So there's three price reductions. If you price your house competitively from the beginning, you're gonna sell higher and faster. How does that sound to you? Does that sound good, Connie? That sounds great. <laughs> okay, so let's, all right, so what's the next objection? When listing a house? The percentage. Yep. <laughs> Why do you deserve so much of my money? <laughs> yeah. So when we do our um, listing presentations, everything is already printed out. Um, inclusions, exclusions. If we don't know those exactly, we'll leave that part blank. But our commission structure is on there. And on ours, I believe it's six. I'll have to look at it. Six, seven, eight percent plus $695. And so as we're going through the listing, let's say they agree and they'll say, what's your commission? Um, I'll say it's 6% plus a $695 Keller Williams commission fee. And I go right away into, and of that 2.4% goes to the co-broke. So it's not another 2.4% on top of that 6%. And by that time, their minds going, what, what? And we, I just keep going. Um, what would be an objection to that? Well, I have somebody who said they can do it for 4%. Okay, so what concerns me about that, Connie, is that someone is so quick to reduce their commission. And why that concerns me is how quickly are they going to drop on their side, the negotiation on your behalf with your co-broke. So you're getting a full-time broker who is gonna be negotiating on your behalf. So I, it makes me nervous that someone's going to automatically take less because I have a feeling that that's what's gonna be happening when they're negotiating on your behalf. Well, $8,000 is a lot of money. Right. 
And my job is to make sure that you get the most that you possibly can. So you're hiring the best, you will get the best. And I just say, um, I'm in a deal right now. I have a buyer and the seller's um, listing agent is a three percenter. And it has been, a I can say firsthand why it's important. And, and it's interesting because my folks are going to be selling their house and they want me to sell it, which is great. But they would like, they would, they are going to spread the word to not do one of these flat rate guys because it was, it's been so difficult. And even the sellers have complained to me asking me if I could take over on their part <laughs> because they, they, this, this person doesn't communicate. He didn't tell them anything about the RE, the filling out the, the record. He just handed it to them, didn't say anything to them. And so they just put nothing, they put nothing, even though they knew there was a lot of things about the house. And therefore, when we did the inspection, they're paying $10,000 worth of things to fix radon, mold, mm -hmm. I mean, bracing the basement. I mean, it's just terrible things, a lot of which they knew, but they didn't realize that they had to really put it down in the RECR. It, just the whole way the communication has been so terrible. And even with me, because he's like, Annie, I'm just so busy. That's his yeah. response all the time. I'm so busy. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And I see that a lot too. I, um, I make it more of a value add to work with me. And I don't want to go into, and I know you, that's not what you meant, Annie. I'm not going to really sit and bash a discounted agency because we all know what their service level is. It's if you're going to hire me at 6%, I almost make it a uncomfortable situation for them to even ask me to reduce my commission. It's, this is what it is. This is what I charge. And this is what you're getting for that 6%. Getting a lot, you know? So I, it's really a non-issue. I am not going to lose a listing over a half a percent if I'm competing. So at the end of the presentation and they're still pushing me on commission, I will then pull that out and say, other than the commission, is there any, any other objections, um, any other issues that you would like to talk about um, working with me? Other than that, is there any questions or concerns? No, we, we're all in, we agree, we like what you're, you do, and we like what your team, or you, know, you're, you have a team even though you're a solo agent. All mm -hmm. right, so I kind of take it out of there. Then I go into what is the net value that you're wanting? Because if I'm going to sell your house at 98% original list price to sale price, in my mind, that's a 4% list. So you can take the market center stats and find out what, you're at, what their average list to sale price is and kind of turn it that way. That it's really not about the 6%. It's about the person that's working for you and getting the most they possibly can. So pull stats from the market center if you don't have yours. And you're not going to get as much pullback. Um, I had an interesting one last night. Um, they said, Janine, we want to work with you. It's a home in Whitefish Bay to put on the market. And we want to buy out in Lake Country. Um, here's our price range. But we want to go ahead and try to sell our house in Whitefish Bay by ourselves first. What the hell, oh, Dolly? So, <laughs> so, you know, they left this on my voicemail. So I'm thinking about this going, huh, okay, this is interesting. And they're friends of mine, which makes it even worse. So I called them and I said, you know what, you guys, I challenge you to find someone that sold their house and it's like a $950,000 house um, for sale by owner. You're not going to find it. You know why? Because any buyer that's coming to your house is going to have an agent guarantee you. And that agent then is going to be negotiating for the buyer. You're going to have absolutely no one. And that is going to be a disaster. Maybe not on the negotiation of the home price, but home inspection. So 
Also guys, statistically it's 14 to 16% less by, uh, for sale by owner versus working with the broker. You're going to actually make more money by having someone represent you. And then they went, oh, okay, I get it. Yep, we'll list. So it could be just having that conversation. But thinking they're going to get more money by not working with someone is incorrect. And actually, they're very vulnerable if they're not represented. Penny and Janine, can I ask, once you get into a counter situation, counter offer situation, and, they're, and the, the seller wants to close the deal, but they're not willing to budge, and they ask you to throw in some of your commission to make the deal, then what? No. 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 No, I'll just say, you know, it, honestly, it, it's never going to come back on me for my money. It's not my house. <laughs> I mean, it's not my property. So I'll say, listen, you guys, if it's a seller, are you willing to walk away for $5,000? We're already through home inspection. We're working on the appraisal of the property to go back on the market and have another inspector come through that now we have to disclose everything that came up on the inspection report, but there is a chance that another inspector is going to find something different. So what is it worth if your house payment is $3,000 a month and your monthly taxes are $1,000 a month, that's already $4,000. And now we're going to push it out another two months. So logically and financially, it's not the best decision. Let's go ahead and sign this amendment and let's move forward, shall we? And they'll say, shut up, Janine. Yes, I'll sign it. I mean, <laughs> you, you just have to go back to their drive and their motivation. I don't know what the next two months are going to be like. You know, statistically in the summer, our market really slows down. Now, this is not your average market right now, but I don't know what the future holds and I don't know when interest rates are going up. So it could change your buyer's buying power too. If interest rates shift, you could be eliminating a lot of buyers from the buyer pool in your price range. Correct. Um, Connie, I'm going to think about it. I interviewed my agents and um, I just want to, I want to think about it. I want to think about it overnight. <clears throat> um, okay. So is there anything that we're not agreeing on here with listing your property? No, I think I agree with everything. You, I, I liked your presentation and I agree with everything you're saying, Connie. Perfect. Well, it is a very busy market at this point in time. Um, our team strives to do the best we can for our sellers to get you the most, um, most amount of money. So when we sign this contract today, I can get started on your marketing pieces. And if by tomorrow morning you decide that um, I'm not the right agent for you, I can definitely tear up this contract, but we should really get it signed today. So um, we can start the marketing process for your home, especially with the market being as crazy as it is. Hmm. So. We're the best I people for you. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> no, I like that. I like that. So if, if for whatever reason I wake up tomorrow morning and say, Connie, you know what, we've had a change of heart, you would allow us to get out of the contract. Yes, you can get out of the contract. But I just want to let you know that I would love to work with you. And um, we can get started on all of your marketing pieces right away because time is of the essence. Especially okay. if we want to get you into your next home. Okay, let's do it. So that happens a lot where they'll say, um, I have to think about it. Now, I always envision myself that I cannot remove my rear end from the chair. Like, I am not moving until you sign. But there are some that really need to go through that process. And I'm not gonna, you know, bully them into not. But I will point out, ask them, where am I on the list? There isn't really a better or a worse. It used to be we wanted to be there last, 
because then, you know, we're save the best for last. But then if you're a really good listing agent and you go in there and you're the first agent they interview and they're blown away, you will get that listing signed. Not always. Um, but I, in the beginning was like, well, oh, great. So I'm third. Awesome. I can't wait to meet with you. And then I'm thinking, I'm going to sign them and get out the door. Uh, no, a phone call happens and say, Janine, we're canceling your appointment. We went with our first listing agent that we met. Damn it. So um, if I can't get it signed at that appointment, um, and I'm going to try like hell because what Connie said is what we do too. Why don't we go ahead and sign the listing agreement today? And if you have a change of heart, let me know tomorrow morning by eight o'clock. Never in the ever have we heard from anyone, you know, ever. Um, so back to what were we talking about? The signing the listing. If they come back and say, um, Connie, what is your listing um, length? Like how long do you take a listing for? We take listings for six months. This ensures that um, we will get your house sold. Um, I, I Actually, I don't even explain. I just say six months. Okay. All right. Somebody just asked, um, we are meeting with another agent later today, and I will let you know our decision after our next meeting. Awesome. Can you let me know who that agent is? Who is it that you're interviewing? I just want to know. And nine times out of the ten, they won't tell you. Um, so I just had this happen last week. Um, went to the appointment. They were meeting with three agents. I think we were the first people in. Jordan and I went. And he said, this was on a Friday, I think. He said, I'm meeting with someone on Saturday and Monday. I'll let you know Monday afternoon. He had a horrible experience buying this property with another agent. And I found out what triggers him. When he bought his property, he felt as though it was in a price range where this particular agent um, felt it wasn't that he wasn't worthy. So communication sucked. Um, so I went right into how that is so important on, on our side, that communication is key. And so I kept keeping in touch with him over the weekend you know, wrote him a thank you note as soon as I left. And then I called him on Saturday, left him a voicemail. And guess what? Saturday afternoon, he called and said, you know, we want to list with you. So find out what their past experience has been mm -hmm. and ask them how they like to communicate. Do you respond better via text, email, or phone call? You know, how is it that you like to communicate? And they love to hear that because then you're going to follow that lead. You know what? My wife and I are really big texters or, you know what? We're offended by texting. There are people that have told people on our team that I really do not like the fact that you are constantly texting me. And it depends on the age group. Please pick up the phone. I want to have a conversation. You don't know, right? Yeah. And there are other people who do not like to talk on the phone and they only work by text. Right. Or, you know, I'm on the, I'm on my computer all day long. Just email me. Yeah. So find out how they like to talk. Yep. Um, so Connie, we're agreeing with everything. we agree with your 6%, all of that. Um, but I do not feel comfortable with a six month contract. I'd like to do 60 days, Connie. Well, 60 days isn't enough to um, get through a contract and get your house sold. And I put up a lot of money up front for marketing pieces that I pay out of my pocket. So in order to ensure you know, that we get through our, our, our deal, I need to sign a six month contract. Okay. Well, what if I'm, what if we're not happy with each other? What if things aren't going along as they should? I mean, how do I get out of that? Oh, I have never had anybody cancel <laughs> unless if it was a medical emergency. But, um, you know, if I'm not happy with you and you're not happy with me, we can definitely cancel this contract. It's not a problem. Great. 
Thank you. And you know what? People like to hear that. We always say, you know, agents aren't going to be telling you, but really it's a service contract. So if you're not happy with their service, I please, I want you to reach out to me and let me know. And I'm going to try to repair and fix anything. Um, at that time, if it's still not working out, I will expire your listing. And this is why I want you to be happy. And if I'm not doing my job, then we need to terminate our contract. Um, it's a small community. Milwaukee is a small, a small town really, and word gets out. And I want you to be a really happy client. So absolutely, we can terminate this at any time. Mm -hmm. And some you want to terminate. Yeah. <laughs> I have one so, right now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, Okay, so now we have signed the listing agreement. Everything's great and we get an offer. Let's say the house is at 500,000 and it's been on the market for a couple weeks and we get an offer for 475. Connie, this is absolutely ridiculous. I'm offended by this offer. It's $25,000 below. Are you kidding me? I know. You know what? Sometimes people have unrealistic expectations and I totally understand. But now let's look into this offer and let's pull out some of the good things in this offer and see where we can negotiate the price for you because it has been on the market for two weeks and the market really tells us where a house should be priced. So um, let's, let's look at all of the details, not just the price. So um, they're not asking for any, um, any seller credits. So that's good. So it's a straight up price. Um, inspection is very standard that they're asking for an inspection contingency. They're putting 20% down, which, you know, means that they do have the money to do the deal. And we do have a prequal letter. So, you know, we do have the backing here. And these are all really good things. Let's take, um, let's take a look at the difference and see where we can negotiate. And we can definitely do a counter offer for you. And I absolutely love how you did that because you went right to the positive. You went right to the positive of that offer. Let's look at the positive things. Look at the positive things. And what I do, I have a standard letter or spreadsheet that I fill in um, for presenting offers. And number one is always the price. Number two is earnest money. If they're putting down $1,000 or if they're putting down $5,000, they're serious if they're putting down 1% or more um, as your earnest money. Um, I put down the financing and the type of financing. I put down the contingency date of the financing, the contingency date of the appraisal, the contingency date of the inspection and radon if need be. Um, what else am I missing? Oh, and the closing date. And maybe who the lender is sometimes. Yep, and I do add in the, the prequal letter for them. Mm -hmm. um, and I contact, a lot of times, if, if things look kind of funny, if you're not sure of it, call that lender and have a conversation with them and say, you know, this is for 3% down. They're asking for, seller, um, for a seller kickback. Is there a reason for this? Or can they do it without? And I'll just call the lender right out. I have a listing. I need to know what's going on. Yeah, good for you. I love that. Um, all right, so we're $25,000 apart. And let's say that you, you really thought that house should be priced at four eighty, dollars and you mm -hmm. told them that. Yep. They wanted to push the price. So here we are at four seventy five. dollars How do you handle the negotiations with that $25,000? spread and you know where the where the sellers want to be at so how do you handle that so in the beginning when we did your um your comparison for pricing your house remember we were at four hundred eighty thousand dollars, and i know that you want all the money that you can i to I, I totally understand this so we we're at four hundred eighty thousand dollars. um they're at 475 what would you feel comfortable countering at because i know that you're really at four hundred eighty thousand dollars. Where, where would you feel comfortable to counter just so we don't have to go back and forth four or five times because we really want to get this, this deal moving, especially if you want to close by July 15th. 
another good point. You're going back into um, what their motivation is. Mm -hmm. um, you're good, Connie. Um, I don't know, Connie, I feel like, you know, we've only been on the market for two weeks. So I would like to counter back at 495. Okay, so if we lose this deal, keep in mind we are, we're at June 4th. So if we want to close by, by July 15th, that's five weeks. Most lenders need 30 to 45 days to close. If we lose this offer, we may not get another one for another two weeks, which puts us past our date of July 15th, and you will not be able to move to the lake at that point in time. All right. Is this something that you're, that you're willing to lose? Especially well, we when we were, you know, we were at 480. Can we give it a shot and see what happens? Are you willing to lose it? I wouldn't. You wouldn't? What I would you suggest? You know, what's a, what's a halfway, even if we, so we were at 480, how about even a 485? Okay, but we're not moving off of that, Connie. If we come back to 485, I hear this, do you hear that? We are not coming off of it. Great, let's give it our best shot and see what we can do. And Connie, I want you to tell these, this buyer's agent that this is our final offer. Definitely. I am going to tell them that this is, this is, we're, we're tight and this is, you know, I'm working for you. I'm going to tell them that we're tight and see where they come back at. And I'm just going to be really stern with that buyer's agent and say, you know, this is the best we can do. We are 15,000 off, off of asking. And, and I think it's fair, even though we don't have to tell them we originally had 480. We'll keep that between ourselves. Okay. All right. Go ahead and write it up. Perfect. Perfect. And then we can get you moved by the 15th of July. Okay. I hope they take it. Well, I'm glad I'm friends with both of you. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> well, and it's funny with all the negotiations and I've learned, I've learned from so many people and I feel very comfortable talking with Janine and I do freeze up sometimes with people. I'm like, <gasps> I do too. You know, it's, it's easier because Janine and I really have a, a great relationship yeah. and I'm telling you right now, yesterday, I could have strangled somebody with my bare hands with a couple of things that are going on. So you guys don't get discouraged. I have a 93 year old man. I am oh, yeah. not even going to say I'm hoping what happens to him. <laughs> I, it's, it's a struggle. And all of these, look at me, all of these conversations that we're having, I've had with him and it's not going anywhere. Oh yeah. You've had a lot of objections from him. Yeah. So I think that, you know, for the most part, when you're brand new, you're most likely going to be working with buyers. Yeah. And the first objection is going to be buyer agency and going back to, you know what, I want to represent you. Yes. And until I get the sign, I work for the seller. Yes. And I cannot give you any opinions at all about this property. Because well, and I just and tell them this is state law. I yeah. have to have a buyer agency sign if I'm going to help you purchase and negotiate a property. Right. And I can't make any phone calls for you if I don't have this sign. Right. I can't even give you comparables and let you know what the other properties have sold for. So um, I, I'm 100% in, but I need for you to be 100% in, and that's how I operate. Mm -hmm. Well, um, and keep in mind, we do a lot of work without being paid, a yeah. lot. And by having a buyer agency, it doesn't ensure that you're going to purchase, help them purchase a house and get paid, but it sure takes that percentage up quite a few notches. Yes. And honestly, to have that discussion and what that means, um, oh gosh, it was a couple years ago, I was somewhat new and someone came into our open house and said, I'm working with an agent. And if I stop then I am not, I don't want to take anyone from anybody that is not my, my deal. Mm -hmm. um, and they took my card though. And it was like three or four months later and they called me and they said, we actually um, are going through the procedure of terminating our agent. And 
we're in the midst of this. We want to have a sit down with you because we need a different experience. Mm -hmm. I learned so much from that couple of what their expectations were. Honestly, I can't say it may not have been the agent's fault. I don't think it was anyone's fault. There was just not the dialogue, yeah. that conversation. And I can be just as guilty as that first agent. So I never bash another agent, even though I want to. I am never going to talk negatively about any other agent or brokerage because it reflects on you. Uh -huh. And it'll come back to you. I yeah. find that if I have a sit down and I understand it's been difficult with this whole COVID thing, but if I have a sit down with buyers, I invite them to the office or I'll meet them at a Starbucks and I bring my computer and I bring a buyer agency with my folder with my buyer's information and to give them information about myself with the, with the presentation. If I do that, I get them 100% of the time. 100% of the time I have found a house for them because I sit down and really have a great conversation with them and say, this is, this is what I do. I'm here for you. Here's our buyer agency. I'm doing ABCD. I'll put you on a portal. I am available by text, by phone, by email. Let's sign this buyer agency. While you're signing this, I'm going to pull up some properties for you right now so we know what we're looking at. Yeah. And we, we're off and running. I've had actually two referrals and there were younger couples. I met with them literally at a Starbucks, went to show them three houses, had an accepted offer in a week because I sat down and explained everything up front. Yeah, that's awesome. If you guys can think of any objections, throw them up on the chat so then we can try to help you out. Anything that you've come up with yourself or you're afraid that someone's gonna ask you and you don't know how to respond, um, you're gonna you're you're gonna hear everything. Um, but on the buy side, it's buyer agency writing that offer at a competitive price. So if it's a brand new listing and you feel as though the price is priced correctly and you're you've you've gotten to the point where now you finally are gonna be writing an offer and you find out that your buyers are low ballers and they just want to test the market. So I have that conversation way up front with the buyer that yeah. this is not the market to lowball anything. If I see that something is priced significantly high, I will definitely let you know, but the market determines the price. Um, here's that app. Yep. Yeah. And it's amazing. Focus one, focus, focus title one. one. It's the agent app. It's a free app. Go in and it will um, price out your net. It will also price out your net for your, um, for your buyers. So, also. Yep. Buyer and seller. seller. Um, so I had a listing and just recently two offers. One was, 10 over and one was at asking price and i know the agent that wrote at asking price and he had the conversation with the with his buyers and they said you know what we're not willing to spend ten thousand dollars more on this property and the conversation went like this more than likely this home is going to sell for over asking i don't know what that looks like um but I highly suggest if you want to be in the running, you're going to want to go X amount over. And they didn't. Um, and they didn't get the house. Yep. <laughs> so the conversation also, and there are a number of agents when you call, especially on a hot property, call that agent. I've gotten mysterious offers. They just popped in the yeah. email, no phone call, no message, no, no nothing. And I always look at that offer as the bottom of the pile, especially if we're in a multiple offer situation. Yeah. Uh, because there was no communication for the offer, which means there's probably not going to be good conver conversation um, through the whole deal. So I kind of put that one at the bottom of the pile. Second of all, when you're writing an offer, make sure to call that agent 
tell them it's a beautiful day. The sun is shining. Just suck up right off at the beginning. It's, it'll help, I promise. Um, ask them, you know, do you have multiple offers in hand? Are you expecting any offers? And some agents will say, just write your highest and best. Others will say, you know, and I'll say, will asking price be enough? And like I said, some agents will say, write your highest and best. Others will say, I don't think asking is going to be enough. And then you know where you're going. Um, ask, you know, there, there are important questions. When do the sellers want to move? What's the best closing date for them? Um, you know, these things all are very, very important. So Connie, on the flip side of that, when you have buyer's agents calling you on a listing yep. and is, you know, trying to field those answers, how are you answering those to them with saying, you know, I've got offers for 10,000 over. Um, I answer how I like to be answered. You can't tell them exactly what your numbers are, but um, just tell them you have multiple offers. And if they ask, you, you can't tell them things, but if they ask, you know, will asking price be enough? You can say, I don't think asking will be enough. When um, closing is the most important for the sellers, they have a small baby, um, we would like to get this taken care of as quickly as possible. You know, you can say some things, but you cannot tell them the price. <clears throat> where, where do you go with all of that? Yeah, I really don't say a, a whole lot. Um, and I, I, lo I love being on the listing side and getting multiple offers. Um, especially if I have something that I know is the offer that we're going to go with. And, um, that, that agent is so eager. They usually call and say, is there anything I can do? And this is a good point for a buyer's agent. Is there anything I can do before you present offers? So let's say it says in MLS, any and all offers to be presented Saturday at five o'clock. If I were a buyer's agent and it's three o'clock, I would call that buyer's agent and say, I'm sure you have most of your offers in hand. Is there anything that I can do immediately before you present to make mine more attractive? And then shut your mouth. <laughs> and you would be surprised of what will come out of some of these agents' mouth. Um, one was, if you um, attach an addendum O, which is an occupancy agreement, and let the seller stay a week after closing for free, that would be a great benefit. Boom, done. Yep. I redrafted the offer with the addendum O attached and sent it through. So if you're competitive, call a couple hours before they say they're gonna present and say, is there anything I can do to make my offer the most attractive? Now they shouldn't really tell you any specifics, but they might. Mm -hmm. um, I love doing that. And as a listing agent, when someone calls me, I am not going to give them information other than, um, let's say they're spot on with everything but closing date, which they should have figured out before they wrote the offer. Yep. And I would say, you know, the ideal closing date, because you never called to ask, I wouldn't say that, but that's what I'm thinking, is July 26th. Oh, and by the way, the sellers really would like occupancy through the end of the month. And I would, I would hope that you would know that would be free of charge. <laughs> and you know what? Their offer may be the best, but you're trying to get a little bit more from that buyer before, so you don't have to um, counter offer. Yeah. It works both ways. It's super fun. I like so, to do that occupancy. That's a great idea, Janine. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. If it's a family moving from one house to the other, it would be really nice to have that extra week. Ooh. Yeah. That's a really nice competitive edge that I have been using because they're all closing on the same day. If that buyer doesn't need to get in that day, let the seller stay there for whatever, a week, by mm -hmm. whatever is really attractive. That might be, that might be the golden ticket for you. It may not even be the price as much, you know? I don't know. Yep. Um, 
Any other objections that you guys can think of? Uh, I don't have an objection, you guys, but um, I do have a question. I have a potential listing in Greenfield, which I know nothing about, and obviously I'm still green, <laughs> so I don't know a lot anyway, but um, my question to you is I've had an offer for another agent to help, and he actually said he might have four buyers for this property, but how can he help and advise me if he's bringing the buyer? What do you need help with? I need help knowing if the, the list price is right um, and just like, I, I don't know the community at all. And so. Yeah, honestly, I think, and that's a really good question because I was always like numbed when I went into an area that I had no idea what the heck I was doing. So I was really mindful of doing that radius search of solds and looking at comparables really well. And you can get a 99% of your information can come from that search the last six months. And then look at, once you've already gone through the property, look at the ones that are currently on the market that are similar to yours and call those agents and find out, you know, how many showings they've received that you're actually going to be listing a property similar to the, to theirs. You know, what has the market been like? And that's such a really great little area. I don't think you're going to have a problem selling it. So, uh, I would do my research first and come up with your own list price and then reach out to, it could be something that has buyers to say, you know, what, looking at the data, what are you thinking would be a good range for list? But I wouldn't just rely on that source. I would probably have another source as well. Yeah. Yeah. And you do okay. have contacts at the office that you can bounce it off of also. Yeah. Okay. And, and you know what? Um, just because you don't know the area that well, everything other than not feeling comfortable because you don't is the same. You're going to market that property the same. So the only thing that's up here in your mind, I think, is the price. So do your due diligence. Look at the sold properties. Have an idea of what you think it should go for. Maybe ask, does the seller have an idea of what they think a fair price would be? Yeah, so I, I ran comps and without knowing what their improvements were, I haven't even been in the home. This is my dentist. I was there on Monday and this all transpired. And on Monday afternoon, I, I sent her some, the CMA. Yeah. Um, and then she gave me her list of improvements. And last night she got back to me with the question that I had asked her and said that she and her husband want 360 for it. So that's more than what I thought, but it's not like I, I, in researching the area, the new construction homes are going for like 410 right now. So she could be in there, you know, she might be in there. Yeah. And you know what? The market's going to determine the price. So knowing the price that they want, I would, that makes it a lot easier for you. Look at what has sold from 360 to 340 and then compare that to what they have once you see the property then you're going to know and if you want have an agent that could go with you and also have an opinion wouldn't it be a waste of time uh, we've we've done that all, all the time it's like huh i'm really stumped on this or i'm not quite sure about the area um two heads are better than one Okay, great. Because Thank then, you. Because then when you, when you give them the price that you think it should be, you, they're like, oh, okay, well, she didn't just like pull that out of a hat. She did her due diligence. She is showing, and people are analytical, and I'm sure Dennis are, um, very anal retentive. They want to see the data. So as much data as you can provide, the better. Yeah. Um, anyone else? Um, I have a message here. What going back about 20 minutes ago? Um, what's the calculation used to get the assessed to sale? 
Um, so what you're gonna do is look up the tax in the taxes, the assessed price. And what you're doing is you're grabbing the sold properties and divide your assessed price by the sale price and you'll get a percentage on what properties are selling. In most communities, <laughs> they're selling over assessed value. So if your average is 10% above assessed value, then if the property is assessed at $400,000, your price, your assessed to sale price would be $440,000. Does that make sense? So I looked up a property and um, last year's assessments on the tax information, um, I went on the county um, site and it said it actually listed the fair market value. Um, it's someone that's interested in a property that's not on the market. Mm -hmm. So um, that's your assessed fair market value though. It isn't the um, real estate fair market value. Yeah. Right. It's completely two different things. Exactly. Mm -hmm. One is what you're being taxed on. And you know what? That is going to range from home to home. Mm -hmm. It could be that that seller went to the um, village and protested their assessed value amount. And the village didn't put up a fight and said, okay, you're right. There's, there is no rhyme or reason for a lot of these. I know mm -hmm. Milwaukee County did a huge reassessment, which is actually closer to what would be market value but it is not the case in every home. Right. Yeah, so I give little uh, recognition of an assessed value. Yeah, it's, a, it's, it's tricky because it's a, it's, a, it's a property that has access to a lake with a shack on it. <laughs> oh Lord. So it's, it's, yeah, it's really just, you know, the lake, pro it's the property, the access. So it's like, well, this is what the fair market value says, but it's kind of like, how much, What's the value? What What do you want for this? What What are you willing to pay for this? <laughs> there you have it. Another one that we've come up with is, oh, Janine, we just had our house appraised because we were refinancing. Well, guess what? Um, you're gonna find out, I don't know if you've come with across this, Connie, that that appraised value that was given by their lender for a, a refinance is typically gonna be higher than what a market value price would be. It's gonna be whatever they want for cash out. Yeah, so you have to explain that to your seller that that is awesome information, but this is really how it works. Mm -hmm. And of course, they're gonna they're gonna come up with that price regardless, but it's not to put on the market and sell. All of these buyers are working with buyer's agents and they're pulling their, their data and we're all going to be coming up with pretty much the same number, not the bank that is refinancing your house because they want to give you the highest amount that they possibly can. Mm -hmm. So it's really hard to get past that on some cases, but if you have what about the opposite of that, someone that um, really wants to price it well over the appraised value. Um, again, why is that appraised value where it is? So, you know, my question is, if it's really low, I'll ask them, did you ever go to the city or village and contest your, um, your amount? Because you did a wonderful job because you've been really taxed on such a low amount. Um, so mm -hmm. honestly, the market value is this. That information is pure gold to me. My house is getting appraised tomorrow for refinance. <laughs> I did a whole packet for my very delicate appraiser because I heard they're delicate. So I did come, I got some neighborhood information, some other stuff, because we're going to be redoing a bunch of things. So yeah, any list of improvements, things to know, that's all really welcome information. So going off tangent, when you do have a listing and it is going to be appraised by the buyer's lender, make sure you're there for that. Yeah. Because if it doesn't appraise out, your seller is gonna be really ticked off. And if you're not there to meet the appraiser, they're gonna think, well, she or he wasn't there to show them all the bells and whistles, 
all the list of improvements. Now, mind you, they pretty much have that, mm -hmm. um, but not necessarily the list of improvements and things to know. So we're there meeting, making everything really simple for them and you don't follow them around because they don't want you to. Um, and you basically say, here are the list of improvements and things to know. And if you have any questions, I'm here. And I would say six out of 10 will have questions. Like, you know, did you know, do you know how old the furnace is? It's not listed on here. So really know what those answers are. And one more thing, Connie and I were talking about amendments. When you get to the point where you are writing a home inspection amendment for your buyer, never refer to the home inspection report. We used to. Like, um, buyer and seller in, re in receipt of home inspection data, da, 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 da. Don't ever put that in there. Um, per inspection report, page five, da, da, da. I've had agents that will write in page five uh, on report, do this, this, and this. And I literally return to sender and say, I do not want the home inspection report to be acknowledged on your amendment. Why? Because then that lender can say, I want a copy of that home inspection report. And it could blow up in your face. So don't refer to it. Right, Connie? Not anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I've had it happen and it wasn't good. It was my listing and the buyer's agent wrote in referring to the report that lender then wanted a copy of the report. We did not send it, but the buyer's agent did to that lender. And then the lender, like two days before closing, wanted to come in and inspect all these things that were not called out on the inspection and look at them. Mm. And it delayed closing two weeks. And then we quickly realized we're never doing that again. We're never allowing it. So Janine, when you're writing up as a buyer's agent, <clears throat> the amendment to the inspection, what's your verbiage? Um, I'll give it to you right now. Hold on, I'll give it to you exactly. Pull it up. Seller hereby is agree. Oh wait, no, that's not it because that was hers. Never mind. Here we go. All right. The inspection and testing contingencies are hereby waived, provided seller at seller's expense to do the following items. All lien waivers and receipts to be provided no later than three days prior to close. And then I list the items that we want addressed. So I'll repeat that. The inspection and testing contingencies are hereby waived, provided seller at seller's expense to do the following items. All lien waivers and receipts to be provided no later than three days prior to closing. So Can number, yeah. Let me do a, a screen share here because everything is in zip forms mm -hmm. with the verbiage. So. And everyone's gonna have different verbiage. It's gonna vary, don't you think? Um, yes, it will, but it is in zip forms. And all you have to do, I'm disabled, for screen sharing. Is anybody, uh, who's on for a KW Milwaukee here? I cannot, I'm disabled. Um, uh oh, <laughs> share screen. Oh, here we go, I'm back on, somebody popped me on. Okay, so here's your zip forms. Um, your amendment to offer to purchase. So when you're filling these out in zip forms, 
Can everybody see this? Yeah. Okay. So by other, when you click on other, click on other, this little pencil shows up. Click on the little pencil and then pick up on this, that little scrolly. On the top box here is offer to purchase. When you do the drop down, your amendment, this is your WB41, amendment to the offer to purchase. You can put in verbiage for your offer to purchase, a notice, amendment to your buyer agency agreement. This is all of your categories for your amendment WB41. Your next drop down is all of your verbiage, yay, for anything that you need for your inspection amendment, your radon, financing contingency satisfaction, buyer home warranty waiver, blah, 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 okay? So when you click on inspection amendment, this will do an auto populate. The following shall be completed at the expense of the seller with all applicable lien waivers, invoices, and permits provided to the buyer no later than 10 days. If you have a shortened time frame, you can change that to five days prior to closing. Upon acceptance by all parties, the inspection contingency as described in lines 194 to 204 of the offer to purchase is hereby waived. Insert. Oh my gosh, look at that. How cool. It's there. Okay. And then what you're going to do is make it clean. I am a freak about this. Somebody yes. is, probably Janine told me to do this. So what you're going to do is one, seller two, blah, 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 blah. Skip a line. Number two, seller two. Blah, and you blah, guys, blah. you can take that verbiage that you're asking the seller to do right out of the inspection report word for word it's and you're going to find that most likely in that detailed summary section of the home inspection report and just because they're going to have a copy of that report the seller is they're going to know exactly what they need to do there's there's no question so put it in there replace gf And kitchen and main bathroom. Period. Okay. Yeah. So word for word on what was on the inspection. I've done this one a couple of times. This is usually the verbiage. <laughs> Hire right. a licensed electrician to inspect and replace GFCI outlets in kitchen and main bathroom. Hey guys, I want you to be really mindful of going on top of this amendment because if you're new or even not new, this could kick you in the ass. Um, it, I think it may have with me at one point. <laughs> really watch four and five because this is when sneaky stuff can show up on a home inspection amendment. They may ask for, you know, whatever they ask for, but then they may go in and change the purchase price to be changed from 500,000 to 495. So, you know, you will catch it, but I had, I remember I was looking at it on my phone and I sent it over to my sellers. I'm like, you guys are really not asking for much. And then I went back and looked at it and called them and went, except for line five, where they actually reduce the cost of the purchase price from 10,000. So just keep your eye on four and five. And also when you're a buyer's agent, if you do change the closing date or the purchase price when you're doing an amendment, please be uh, a professional and call that out when you're sending over the counter offer either by phone, text, email, or all three. I sent the inspection amendment over. I want you to um, look at line five and notice the adjustment in price. Because you know what? If you got that to skim by and no one really paid attention, what's gonna happen is there's gonna be some unhappy people on the other end and they're gonna blow it up on, home on, on financing. They're gonna get away, they're gonna find a way out. You don't want a transaction to be built on mistrust on any side. So be very open, mm -hmm. but just be careful. And when you are giving them time to respond to your home inspection amendment, this is my biggest pet peeve. And it's usually with discount brokers. I'm a buyer's agent. I send over the home inspection amendment and I'll give them 
let's say I have seven days left, I'll give them two days to respond to get it wrapped up. Um, I don't hear at all. I'm waiting that two days is here. I have nothing back from that, that listing agent. Really watch those dates and deadlines because I was up until 10 o'clock waiting for this listing agent to send over a signed amendment so I could send it on to my buyer. Yeah. Finally got it and the seller signed in the buyer section and that listing agent never caught it. So I had to text her and say, your, your seller signed in the buyer spot. Yeah. I have been putting a deadline of five o'clock. Yeah. Just because, uh, you know, that 10, 11 o'clock at night thing, it was really cool and fun when I was excited and new. Yeah. <laughs> yeah not really, but it, you know, then you can't sleep and you really have to wait up for it. So I've been putting, you know, and at the bottom, I still have it up here. Um, That's a great idea. At the bottom, it gives you the option on or before the 5th at 5 o'clock p.m. Enter. And more prevalent in the winter months, put in Central Standard Time. A lot of people travel to Florida or California or wherever and they're on different time zones and their five o'clock is not our five o'clock. Correct. Yeah, Correct. I've, I've gotten in a situation where somebody was on a cruise and it was like, like oh my gosh, so from there on out, I've always put in the- Central Standard Time, yeah. Yeah. Does this well, um, inspect, inspection and um, WB41 help you guys? Just put that verbiage right in there. It'll, it'll cover your butt. It does. Hey, we're over on time, Janine. Oh my, okay. Um, so next week, we're gonna have a lender come in for the first part of it to discuss what that process is like for a buyer and what you need to know as a buyer's agent mm -hmm. um, and what that looks like. Uh, I'm not, sh I'm pretty sure who I'm gonna have, but he's a, this person, you wanna have a relationship with the lender that you know is gonna take care of your buyers and that they are gonna have competitive rates and they're not gonna be bugging you for things that you should not have anything to do with and emails and all that junk. So you wanna have someone that you have trust in and I think you should know the process of what that buyer's going through. That's gonna be really helpful because it's super stressful to a buyer that first week of getting all their paperwork together. So he's going to give us some tips and tricks that we can do prior to meeting with the lender that will help everybody out. Mm -hmm. Okay. Ciao. Bye -bye. Thank you guys. Wonderful Have a week. Week. Beautiful. Thank you. It was great. Thank you. Guys Thank, you. So much. Thank you. Have a good week. Thank you. I'm going to try to get my camera working next week. <laughs>